Hello. We're ready for a CCO Club webinar number 85. Our club webinars are set up to pull questions that have come from our CCO Club. If you're interested in our CCO Club, it's real easy to find. It's at cco.us forward slash club. Got a great question that came in this week. Coding tongue cancer and it's an operative port, report. We're going to look at the ICD and the CPT code sets and uh, try to determine if the right codes had been picked. Don't forget, we get these questions from the CCO club. A lot of fun in there. That's where we have club members asking questions if they're taking exams and want uh, some additional information or they're experiencing something unique at work and they want clarification or some research. There's lots of people there to give insight. Both members uh, are instructors, our coaches, and our alumni are all in the CCO club uh, willing to help. You, in the CCO club there's a lot of extra perks. You can get webinar and get to see webinars and support. This particular webinar for example will get put in the CCO club and you can reference it with a transcript and you'll get a copy of the slide deck. There's both billing, coding questions, compliance questions, uh, all the different credentials uh, are being talked about. And then there's extended product support that's available to you. The question that came was, you know, coding a op report with cancer to the tongue. Now, we're going to look at some CPT codes and ICD codes, but the first thing that we have to know is the anatomy of the tongue. It's not something that we talk about a lot, but it's more common than you think to have cancer of the tongue. And the tongue is divided up in regions by where a cancer could be found. I'm going to show you that. Uh, let's start with just the basic anatomy that, that we need to be aware of. These are not terms that you have to have memorized. Again, because we don't deal with procedures to the tongue very often. You know, you might have an ER where there's a laceration. I think I just, uh, ER that I follow out of Georgia that does educational videos because they're a teaching hospital uh, had one drop today that was a child that had a laceration of the tongue so that that was interesting but you don't see things like that very often the basics salivary glands now if you have a person that gets a stone in a salivary gland it usually shows up right here and sometimes their whole face will swell this happened to one of my children we all kind of freaked out not knowing what it was and ultimately the pediatrician said just give him some lemon drops and it'll pass and it did. So see where the salivary glands are located. They're sublingual so that means under the tongue. We notice the teeth and the roots of the teeth. We see also the jaw bone and of course this is a, a, a dissection there is veins that are pertinent. You've got facial veins. There's actually tendons and muscles and ligaments that go around this uh, uh, area, the maxillary and mandibular, mandible areas. Now let's move over to the other side where we go up to the very, very top and it's the first one that you see that kind of makes an arrow, intrinsic tongue muscles. There is several muscles in the tongue that allow us to articulate. And if you if you ever uh, wanted to know how uh, much we depend on our tongue to articulate, just stick your tongue to the roof of your mouth and try to talk without removing your tongue from the roof of your mouth. So it's very difficult. So our 
our tongues are very nimble <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of different muscles involved. I'm not going to name all of these muscles though. But one area that I do want to bring up is the lingual nerve. When people have paralysis, maybe hemoparalysis from strokes, that is uh, not effective anymore, those nerves. And that's why people lose that ability to speak properly. A very interesting stuff, I think. Now, cancer to the tongue. There is two codes that you should be aware of. The tongue itself, uh, several types of cancer that could e come from the tongue, but the most common is going to be squamous cell. There's basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell, and uh, then it goes on from there. Squamous cell seems to be one of the larger types of as in number or frequency that it appears. It ends up being on the flat cells uh, that line the mouth or other organs and there is actually like I said two types of tongue cancer. The first two, uh, the front two-thirds of the tongue that you can stick out is called the oral tongue. So if you, whatever you can stick out of your mouth is oral tongue. Remember that because that term is used over and over again. Malignant neoplasm of the tongue unspecified, meaning we haven't signified where in the location of the tongue itself, oral tongue or past farther down, uh, has the location of the, the malignant neoplasm or you use C02.2 malignant neoplasm of ventral surface of tongue, ventral surface, but are under C02.2. Malignant neoplasms of the anterior two thirds of the tongue, ventral surface, and uh, malignant neoplasm of the fren frenulum lingua. Now let's, let's see if I can go back and uh, I don't think that was noted on this particular, okay, but it will probably be on another one. Let's talk again about the areas of the tongue that can have cancer. Base of the tongue is going to be the back third of the tongue, and that's going to be any of the anatomical structures like the epiglottic uh, valus Valasula, and I don't think that's a kula, it's sula, and uh, the parangeal epiglottic folds. So now we're getting pretty far back into the to that structure itself. Then we go on to dorsal surface. Now again, here's really important where you know those terms like anterior, posterior, dorsal, ventral, uh, etc. Then we'll move on to border of the tongue. So it's that outer aspect and they're specifying that it's between the superior and inferior surfaces. We have ventral surface, uh, surface, the inferior surface of the tongue underneath, anterior two thirds, and then uh, the two, it says indicates a tumor of the front two thirds of the tongue, but doesn't specify whether it was dorsal surface, border, ventral surface of the tongue. And then lingual tonsil is a to the, the tonsils, of course, and overlapping sites. Now, when we define overlapping sites, and you'll see that a lot with cancer codes, that means that we have more areas. All, you know, maybe it's a border of the tongue and the base of the tongue that is defined as being located. Another thing that we need to be aware of is modifiers. The particular procedure that we're going to look at is actually going to use two surgeons. So modifier 62. Now pay attention because if a co-surgeon acts as an assistant when they're doing the procedure, then um, you, you may end up coding that differently. 
Uh, let's see, during the same surgical session, those services may be reported using separate procedure codes with modifier 80 and 82, wherever that's going to be appropriate. All right, now let's look at possible areas where they will take uh, portions of the tongue. Type 1 is a mucoectomy. Notice we have kind of in the middle or on the outside a partial glossectomy, glossectomy where they're going to take a uh, significant portion, but to me that looks like, like a fourth. Then you can have type 3A, a hemiglossectomy, where again, they're almost taking the uh, one half of the tongue, but note when you have lesions infiltrating the intrinsic and minimal extrinsic muscles of the infiltration greater than 10 millimeter but confined within the, oh, I'm not sure if I can say that, ipsilateral tongue. This is when you would use 3A. B or, or type 4A subtotal glossectomy. So we're, we're taking almost all of the tongue. Lesions that arise in the anterior portion of the mobile tongue, notice that is different than the part that we have sticking, that we can stick out. And let's see, exceeds the hemilingual area of the origin involving the contralateral, let's see, genilo, uh, genilod, glockless muscle, but limited to mobile tongue. Whew, that is a lot of words that are hard for me to say. Type 6 is a total removal, glossectomy, and uh, the indications are going to be massive infiltrating lesions. For instance, those of the interior ventral surface of the tongue. We have the dorsum of the tongue, the tongue base, which is bilaterally involved, the extrinsic, let's try this again, genital glossic, mm, hypo, hypoglossus, and let's see, styloglossus with impairment of mobility of the tongue. Notice, okay, we're taking the tongue, but look how when you look at that uh, version where we've dissected, uh, cut it in half, we're really going down into underneath where that ends. Really, that's just sub Q fat in, in front of like the hyphoid bone, I believe, there. So uh, when you take that much of the tongue, there's nothing left to try to articulate. Of course, there would be limited uh, articulation uh, the more we remove. All right. This patient that we'll be looking at is a stage 3. It's stated T3N0M0. This is a different type of code. It is a code that is used for cancer registry. And it's similar, it's set up similar to the way we do our codes with ICD, uh, except the, the verbiage is usually similar, but there's specific things that they're filling out with the code. For a stage 3, T3N0M0, it's a primary tumor that measures uh, 4 centimeters or less and has not spread to the neck nodes. Now we saw where those neck nodes were. And then the NO is uh, or distant organs. MO or uh, tumor is any size. If you have a T1 to T3, that means it's spread to one lymph node measuring three centimeters or less on the same side of the neck in one as the primary tumor in the cancer is not spread to distant organs, M0. So that's what T3 N0 M0 means. If you're interested in tumor registry, uh, working with that, it, there is an exam 
much like the coding exam that you would take for uh, the medical coding credentialing. And there are uh, courses out there that you can take uh, provided by, I think, only one entity. Pretty fascinating stuff, though. All right. Now, again, we're looking at all of this content before we look at the case itself. OK, and um, uh, because I want you to know the information before we look at the case and the person that submitted this put down the codes that they thought were going to be applicable. They wanted to verify that they weren't missing anything and that's why they submitted it to the club. We're very thankful that they did that because it's an extremely interesting case study. I think you'll agree when you get to see it. If we do a right hemiglossectomy, because that's what was stated in the case, the op report that was done, it uh, right hemo, uh, hemiglossectomy with modified radical neck dissection level one through three. 41135 is a glossectomy, and notice partial with unilateral radical neck dissection. If you look at the description of this code in not the definition that's given with the CPT manual, however, the, the description that's provided, uh, I used find a code that explains a little more in depth. It's something you pay a little extra for. It tells you that when you do a glossectomy, you're going to remove less than one half of the tongue. You notice that when we looked at those other diagrams and we were showing how where they could take a portion, whether in the middle or on the side, they're just going to take out a portion of the tongue all the way to the to the diagram where they removed all of the tongue tissue that was there. So for a 41135 means that we're going to be removing less than one half. It has to be less than one half. Then this information that I wanted to include was partial glossectomy is often going to be performed to treat cancers of the tongue because really there's no other reason to do that unless I guess there would be some type of a trauma where the tissue is not viable anymore, but may also be performed to relieve obstruction of lower uh, pharynx to treat an injury to the tongue as well as other conditions. I can't think of too many off the top of my head. You know, we, you, your tongue is very sensitive. If you, We've all bitten our tongue before. <laughs> it makes your eyes water. It, it'll stop you dead and it throbs and it hurts. Actually, though, the tongue is one of the fastest healing areas in the body as well as uh, the eyeball. <laughs> Very interesting if you didn't know that. I learned that working in the ER. So when a person would maybe bite through their tongue or a child would injure their tongue, uh, you, for whatever reason, they often didn't put stitches there. It wasn't an area that you would stitch unless there was like a piece hanging off and they needed to stitch it back because it grows and heals so fast. Now, I don't mean that it grows as in it gets longer, but the 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 cells and the, uh, the repair action of uh, the tongue happens very fast. So within a couple days, it's almost healed. The eye the eyeball itself is like that. When performed for cancer of the tongue, the incision is made in the tongue and the tongue lesion is excised along with margins of healthy tissue, just like if we were to remove a lesion, say, on the arm. We always take margins. Why? Because we want to test the margins outside of the lesion border to confirm that the cancerous cells or abnormal cells haven't extended out past what looks like normal tissue. And thus, they do the same thing with the tongue. Uh, the tongue defect is repaired by suture. Now, this is pertinent. If the excision is more extensive, separately reportable skin grafts or free flap graft may be used to repair the defect. Note, in CPT, one of the areas that new coders struggle with is sequencing 
when it comes to CPT, it usually falls with scenarios like that where they remove a lesion or they do uh, something where the repair is more complex than whatever they did that needed to be repaired, like removal of a lesion. And that means that you're going to sequence the repair. Whatever is more complex always gets sequenced first. That kind of seems backwards because you think it would be in the order that you perform the procedure, but it's not. So that is a pertinent point. A tracheostomy, 31610 for tracheostomy. It is a fenestration procedure with skin flaps. Now that we've gone through all of these, we need to bring up the case itself so that you can look at it. And I thought I had this brought up, but I am looking at my computer now and I don't see it. So just give me a second. I didn't have it. Uh, however, it'll only take me a second to bring it up because I have the CCO Club linked and I go there often. All right, I'm going to pull this up real quick. If I have any trouble, I'll have Jesus help me. He's in the background, but I don't think I will because I think I have it bookmarked. Okay, if you're not familiar with our CCO Club, here is our CCO Club, what it looks like. This is the community and there's a general discussion. We're able to see what is not answered. There's different areas that you can come but this in and look. This is our club discussion area. This particular question came there but we moved it to topic requests because it was so fascinating and I know that Maureen was the one that sent that in. Let me click on that again. It didn't open. I think it's thinking. I thought I had that pulled up and ready to go so here we go. This is how she named it. Extensive surgery for patient with T3, N0, M0 and squamous cell carcinoma of right oral tongue and then it's Dr. B report. So now we're going to look at the report itself. <clears throat> now that you understand all the behind the scenes, how they would do a glossectomy, uh, the different portions and areas that they would take, we literally looked at all of these procedures. All right, the first thing is the 41135. And then she went on the, to, to add the 31610, which is a, a tracheobronchoscopy. And uh, that's done through an established tracheostomy excision. So this patient already has a tracheostomy. And so they're going to go in and, and um, uh, do a bronchoscopy through that. A laryngoscopy direct with or without tracheostomy diagnosis diagnostic and that uh, except newborn because they have their own code and then placing a naso oral gastric tube uh, and then we're going to now look at the report okay the preoperative diagnosis in 3N0M0 squamous cell carcinoma of the right oral tongue okay postoperative it's the same and we would expect it to be the same most of the time, but never assume, always pay attention. I always look at the post-operative and then look at the pre-operative because whatever is post-operative is going to be what we're, we're going to, to code from. Uh, usually though, they always go in and do exactly what they thought they were gonna do, but there's, there's reasons why they might have to do more than they thought. What if they went in there and, you know, they planned to do right oral tongue and ended up having to do uh, uh, the entire uh, tongue like we showed. So here is what the procedures that the provider stated they did. They did that right hemiglossectomy with modified radical neck dissection level one through three. And again, that means they're going into the neck. And when we looked at that very first diagram, we saw 
the jawbone there and they're going to extend down and we saw the areas under sub, not just subglossal but under the mandible where they'll be going they did a tracheostomy with flap then they did a direct laryngoscopy and nasogastric food, uh, feeding tube insertion by physician so those are the procedures that they plan to do and um, we know they did a bronchoscopy through the tracheostomy. Dr. B, and then there was an assistant, Dr. A. If you have two providers, two surgeons, then you're going to need to use a modifier. They use general anesthesia, blood loss, that stuff that you probably don't need to pay attention to. Now, if you're doing anesthesia coding, you're not going to, you may get this report, but this isn't what you're looking at. You're going to look at the anesthesia report instead. Specimens. This is something you want to also pay attention to because it could help you have a heads up that something different's happening within the op report. Uh, we expect to see specimens because this was cancer. So they did, uh, they have a portion of the tongue and it says 1.5 centimeters and then wide mucosal margins with defect sent for frozen section of all which were negative for invasive carcinoma. So the margins were good. They're clean. And, um, and they took a 1.5 centimeter surgical margin. When we're talking about the tongue, 1.5 uh, uh, centimeters, that's, that's kind of big. <laughs> No complications, good, because you can code uh, for that when complications occur. Moving on, we have drains. We don't worry about the drain placement. That's bundled in. That's added into the procedure, so we don't have, need to do that. Indications for the procedure is going to help us with the CPT or the ICD code, and it states uh, now we know a little bit of history. It's a 49-year-old uh, gentleman, and he presents with a mass of the right lateral oral tongue. Biopsy was positive for invasive squamous cell carcinoma, so they did a biopsy before they did this procedure. The patient was noted to have deep muscular invasion. That's why they had to do necrosection. Preoperative imaging studies revealed no significant evidence of metastatic adenopathy, meaning it didn't get into the nodes. Uh, at least from what they could tell. And the patient thus presents for the above listed procedure as detailed below. Okay. And uh, that makes sense, right? Now, anytime when we're reviewing something like this or you're taking a course or you get a uh, maybe a practice test question and you come up with one of these terms that you don't understand, maybe adenopathy, then you write that down in your notebook and then you go look that up and do some research regarding that. Just adding to your knowledge base, not necessarily memorizing, but having it added to your knowledge base and taking the time to look it up will make you a better test taker and it'll make you a faster and more precise coder as well. The description. Now, I'm not going to go through all of this because, for one, it will be in the in the club for you to go and reference. But I want to highlight some things that should make your coding spidey senses going. Oh, that may be pertinent. It still may not be pertinent when you go to get the code, but this will teach you to uh, be aware of things that should pop in your head. We already know the procedures that were done per what they were going to do. Now let's see if there is any extenuating circumstances, not meaning complications, that would help us uh, maybe get to a higher specificity on any of the procedure codes. Plus this just really helps us uh, learn how to read an op report. How they lay down the patient and the staging for the patient is not pertinent to your codes. It's, it's an interesting read, but it's not. So all of this first portion really is not, now maybe on some op reports, but the that beginning description is mostly how they get the patient ready for the procedure and that's pre, uh, uh, prep. So I'm going to skip down. I'm going to look for key words. Now, this is one of the things I'm looking. The, the tumor was mapped and anticipated size. Okay, good. Uh, 
nasogastric feeding tube was placed. So they did put a nasogastric tube in before they even got started. Makes sense. After you have surgery on your tongue, you're not going to be able to eat. And they took a portion of the neck as well. Uh, so again, we, we have a code for that. Uh, we don't need to know how they did it and uh, or what they used to secure it. The laryngoscope, uh, not something that we need either, but an endoscopy was performed. Okay, that is, that was a laryng, the, the, the scope that they used uh, for the bronchoscopy usually. So then uh, we go in here, need for rescription. Okay, then they're kind of still mapping out the and saying, okay, after we take this out, how are we going to do the repair? And that's what this sentence is. From the assistant, we determined the need for reconstruction would be radical forearm, uh, forearm free flap which will be separately dictated by Dr. A. That's key, very important, because you know you've got two surgeons, you already saw that. However, one surgeon is going to take the first part where they're going to remove everything, and the second surgeon is going to repair, and there's going to be two separate op reports. This is the resection, this is not the report for the repair. Right. Patient's face and neck prepped. Okay. Uh, right. Uh, okay. Then they start dissecting. And we really don't need to read much more there uh, because this is all dissection, dissection. Mandibular nerve was identified because they don't want the person to lose the ability to fill. Uh, external jugular vein was dissected away. You know, this is all just interesting reading. Uh, okay, let's see. All these nerves are kept intact. Facial arteries okay. And then we're going to jump down right here. The lymph nodes in level TB were then dissected off the deep cervical fascia. Now, the reason I would say, hey, heads up, let's look, because they're going to take some nodes, right? Usually they do. Are they going to take some notes? We need to find out. So they're identifying them and they're dissecting them off of the, the fascia. Okay, that nerve is identified. The lymph node inferior and posteriorly of the belly pulled uh, with a main nodal packet. One other thing that's kind of fascinating when you do these is that depending on uh, if they think uh, metastasis has happened or if it's gone into the nodes, then they will take more. And it would be a good idea to understand how the nodes are set up anatomically. They look like grapes on a grape vine. So when you open up a bag of those grapes that you get at the grocery store, there's a vine in there and you can take out a cluster of grapes. There's usually what maybe three big clusters of grapes there. And so you can even break off a cluster from a larger cluster. Well that's the way our lymph nodes work too. We have pathways but we have clusters of lymph nodes and the the nodes themselves are nodal little lymph node and then when he's saying this nodal packet, that that's a particular area. And if they think that invasion or some kind of in, uh, uh, metastasis has happened, they will take more lymph nodes. Otherwise, they may just take a few in that particular area. Now, remember, they did the scan prior, and it looked like the nodes were OK. However, they will take a few and send them off to be a biopsy it's confirmed. And if they do find that some of them have uh, malignant cells in them, they'll go in and usually take more because then they may have to resect uh, a larger area. But at as it is, they know they have some invasion into the muscle and that's why they're doing this radical neck section. Okay, so then let's jump down 
uh, level three lymph nodes were divided nodes from level two and three were pulled up so are they going to take visible lymphatic ducts were ligated I think this is still part of them taking the stuff that they just need to uh, let's see the facial everything was kept intact and oh, Okay, so they did. The nodal packets of level two through three were then divided by level and sent to pathology. So they did take them and send them off. All right. So then they're then they're going to clean up. So then they had the tracheostomy with flaps was then performed, and it goes on to explain how they did that. That is usually really straightforward unless there was complications. Uh, you're not going to have a problem. Uh, then they did the. Uh, the removal of the tongue portion. So all of that up there was mostly prepping and getting everything divided. The tumor was mapped out. They took a 1.5 centimeter margin. Everything looked good. Uh, additional five uh, millimeter wide mucosal margins were sent as separate specimens. All right. So we expect to get a path report back. Uh, let's see. Oh, here, all uh, final margins on frozen sections were noted to be negative. The patient was then passed to Dr. A, who performed the reconstructive portion of the procedure. All right, so this is only Dr. B's, and then all the counts and everything uh, were good. Now, when we look at that, let's go back and verify. What did they do? Right, clostectomy glossectomy partial with unilateral reticle neck dissection yes correct code 31610 uh, however uh, 59 I don't think is the right modifier it's the modifier that I talked about that we're going to use 31525 is is um, is the laryngoscopy direct with or without tracheostomy diagnostic except newborn and then 43752 naso or or gastric tube placement requiring the physician's skill and then that fluoroscopic guidance is included in the documentation in the report so I think she nailed it except for the modifier uh, was we need for the assistant surgeon for that second surgeon and uh, but we do have multiple procedures being done. That's the only thing that I could see is that we needed to add that additional modifier. Now I'm interested just off the top of your heads uh, what we talked about. Is there anything else that that you guys saw? Let's open it up to questions and I'm going to take this down and go back over here. There's the 31525 for the laryngoscopy. The 43752 for the uh, nasogastric tube placement. And we're good. Any questions, guys? Let me just go back here and see. Uh, 622 surgeon. Oh, did I put that on here? I think I've got that up here. Uh, where did I put it? Yes, yeah, 62, two surgeons. Yeah, there you would use modifier 62 for the two surgeons, but you would also use that modifier 59 because that's multiple procedures being done. So what I was saying is that yes the 59 that she had on there was okay but but because I think that is for multiple procedures but the 62 add added as well any other questions thank you Kim thank you Jamie all right not seeing any questions other than that Again, this is what it looks like when we uh, have them questions come through. We usually pick some that are topic questions. Sometimes we just have people say, hey, can you do a topic on this? 
it works great and we'll do that uh, we do the research and then we try to educate as we go through and explain it if you want to submit to the club a topic request or just a question and then we say hey this is great can you know we'd like to be able to use this for a uh, a club webinar or an educational tool because we think several people would benefit from this then again please feel free to to submit a topic we used to do as you may remember those monthly Q&A webinars where we would take like six topics and we'd break them down and, and explain those well we can do that still here just not six at a time and it becomes uh, more effective I think and we can spend a whole hour on one particular scenario if you do submit something though you know go ahead and code it out what you think would be the codes don't just give us a scenario and say can you code this we want to know what you're thinking and you know you may be on target or you we may say oh you know what this is a great teaching moment I see what you were thinking but this code is more applicable or this code is a better description of what was happening so uh, try you know give it a give it a whirl but don't submit test questions <laughs> that would not be a good idea <laughs> all right if you want to send your topics it's at uh, cco.us forward slash club all right. Excellent. Well, then we'll see you next time, everyone. Thanks for joining us. And thanks for this great topic.